Take your Bibles tonight and turn to the book of Ecclesiastes over in the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, like somebody said to me this evening, preacher, you got them last night and, uh, and you skinned them. And in case I didn't get you last night, I'll get you tonight. And you say, what do you say that for, preacher? Because uh, one of our jobs is to build saints. And the only way to build you is get rid of the sin in your heart and get rid of the sin in your life, because that's what builds you. Because the closer you get to the Lord, the more you're going to find your sin and the more you're going to deal with it. And then a closer fellowship you're going to have. So that's one of our jobs. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and let's begin with verse 1, because that's my text this evening. Ecclesiastes 10.1 Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savior. Savior. Savor. That's a smell. So doeth a little folly him that is in repetition of wisdom and honor. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that you'll wash my mind in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you'll wash my heart in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, help me to say only what you want me to say this evening, and no more, no less. In Jesus' name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Now notice my text this evening. He said, dead flies. Now the name of my message tonight is six dead flies. Six dead flies. It said, dead flies cause. The dead flies cause something. They're a cause. They cause something to happen. Dead flies cause the ointment. An ointment is kind of like a salve. It's kind of like a salve or a medicine. Cause the ointment of the apothecary. Now the apothecary is a little jar, maybe about this big, and doesn't have a lid on it. Doesn't have a lid on it. And it's a medicine or a salve inside that pocketary jar, that little medicine jar, maybe about that big, maybe about that big around, or maybe that big, maybe that high. And it's sitting up on a shelf somewhere in the bathroom or in, a, in, in the bathroom or maybe in the kitchen somewhere or, or somewhere where you can get at it or where the flies can get to it. Dead flies cause the ointment of the pocketary to send forth a stinking savor. That's a smell. So here comes a dead fly. Oh, this is a live one. <laughs> if he's dead, he ain't flying. My, 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 he hits the window and falls down in the pocket there, he's jar. He's dead. He lays in there. Here, I got five more. <laughs> hit the window, down in the pocket there, jar. There's six of them in the pocket there, jar. And they're going to start sinking. They lay down there in a while, and you don't see them because it's up a little bit high like this. You can't see the shelf. You can't tell, and you forgot to put the lid on the pocket there, jar. And so they start to send forth a stinking smell going up. And then it says, so doeth. And he's going to give you an illustration. And he's going to illustrate something to you as a child of God. So doeth a little, little, little folly him that is in reputation of wisdom and honor. You're here tonight, and you know some. You're called Christians. How many of you are called a Christian tonight? Raise your hand. You're called a Christian. You know what a Christian is? A Christian is comes from the name of Christ. Christian, Christ. Christian, like Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you something this evening. Do you know a greater name on this earth? Outside of Jesus Christ? There's not a greater name. So if that text says, Him that is in reputation, you have a reputation at stake. His name as a stake for what you do. So when a Christian commits a little sin, a little sin, just a little one, nothing big now, not a big old one go out and getting drunk and an old going out and come like that, not a big one, but just a little one. We call them little sins, you know, little white ones we call them, <laughs> little white sin. Just a little bitty fly gets in the apothecary jar, what does it do? It makes you stink before God. Now I wonder tonight if uh, you've got a dead fly in the apothecary jar. i got six dead flies in the apothecary jar. Here's the fly. Get the fly swatter. Bam! Missed him. Bam! Missed him. Bam! Missed him again. 
He's up above the apothecary jar. Got him. Right down in the apothecary jar. Dead fly number one. Write it down. Write it down. Preacher, it's only a little one. Preacher, it's just one little sin. It's only a little sin, preacher. You ever hear him say that to you, brother? You ever tell him that? Preacher, it's just a little one. Just a little one. Now, I want to tell you something. You say, well, preacher, it's just a little sin. Might be bigger than you think it is. Might be bigger than you think is it. You say it's just a little sin. You know what a little sin does? A little sin never stays little. Sin has a thing about it to where sin doesn't stay little. Sin is like a leprosy. Sin is like a disease. A little bit of sin gets on you, and you know what it does? It always grows. It always grows. Sin never stays little. You know, when I'm, you know where a man starts committing uh, uh, great crimes and as a great thief, he always starts with some little sin. Some little bitty sin that just, you know, nothing big, just a little sin. And then he gets started in that little sin. Next thing you know, he becomes a great thief and a great murderer. Why? Sin never stays little. Don't you young people listen to me tonight. Listen to me. Sin never stays small and little. See, it's just a little sin. One time when I was just a boy in school and I skipped, I, right in the middle of lunch hour, I run away from school. I did that quite regular like. <laughs> and I run out of my lunch hour and left school. I was in the first grade and I went downtown. I was walking downtown. I was just a little bitty old kid out in the first grade. And I went in this here uh, filling station, in the filling station, there was candy in there, in, the, in that store. And I went in that store and I looked around, looked around to see if the man was watching me. And I snuck in behind the counter and I took a piece of bubble gum. Took that bubble gum and stuck it in my pocket. And I looked around innocent like, you know, like nobody saw me. And I walked out and I went through the doorway. And that guy that owned the store come over there and grabbed me, put his hand on my shoulder. And fear of God went from the top of my head to the bottom of my toe. And I said, I've been caught. And I started to cry. And that man stuck his hand down in my pocket and pulled out the piece of bubble gum. And pulled it out and says, I caught you stealing this. And I started crying and bawling and I started running. And as I run away, I run away. I said, I'm never going to steal again in my life. And I run away. You know something? That sin was just a little sin. But you know something? That's how every person in this, in this world that starts in the sin of stealing cars and stealing automobiles and robbing banks begin with one sin. Thank God I got caught. Amen? Amen. Thank God I got caught. I praise God that I got caught that day. It lasted me for 10, 15 years before I stole anything else. <laughs> but thank God I got caught then. And I, I, get, I, I stole some milk. I used to get in the middle of the night and I'd go out and I'd steal milk off the front of people's porches. And I'd go by and they'd have milk. Do they have that around here, milk? They'd probably freeze, wouldn't they? But I'd go and I'd steal milk and I'd drink that milk in the middle of the night. And one night I was up on the porch stealing some milk off of people's front door and I was going to drink some of that milk and steal it. And a policeman come by. And the policeman run by there and, and flashed the light, you know, like they're flashing them up on the porch. And I had my hand on that milk bottle and that flashlight from that police car and the red light. That'll put the fear of God in you, brother. I, did, I put it there and I seen that light and I took off running. And that cop started to run after me and I run out in the back of the house and run through the house and hit a clothesline. <laughs> Hit a clothesline like to kill me, man. Bam! Crash down and kill on boat. You say, those are little sins. Yeah, but thank God I got caught. Thank God I got caught. You see, it's just a little one. They never stay little. If you get caught, you ought to thank God. Lord, help me get caught. I'll tell you what you folks ought to do. Say, Lord, help her to get caught. Help him to get caught. Lord, get the cops on him. Catch him. Because if you don't get caught while you're young in life, you get in the habit of it, and then it'll become a big sin. Just a little fly. Just a little bitty fly. I got a man in my church, and he's uh, praying that his brother will get caught. And he, and he gets up in front of the church and says, I want the church to pray for my brother that the cops will catch him. I got a cop that's in my church. <laughs> he just lights up like that, you know. <laughs> About three days later, he got caught. <laughs> He got caught. <laughs> and he said, what for? That guy's got wisdom, see? He's praying. He knows that sin will never stay little. 
Christians come to me and they say, uh, well, preacher, it's just a little one. You know what I say to you? It will never stay little. Of something else, it's bigger than you think it is. Bigger than you think it is. Take your Bible and turn to the book of 1 Samuel. And turn to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. Turn to the verse, 2 Samuel. And 2 Samuel chapter 6. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, look at verse 6. Second Samuel chapter 6 and verse 6 it says, And when they came to uh, Nachish threshing floor, yours put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the ark shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against uh, you, you, U-Z-Z-H, Uza, 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 Uza. I, I believe it, brother. <laughs> I believe it there. I may not be able to pronounce it, but I believe every word in that book, brother. I do. You say, preacher, you don't know the word. I may not know that word, but I guarantee you from the heart of my mind and soul and spirit, I believe every word in that book. I ain't going to change it. You say, well, you can't spell it and you can't read it. It'll make no difference. I believe it. Amen? That's ten times better than a fellow that changes it. What would you rather have? You'd rather have the guy get up in the Pope and say the better translation would be? You wouldn't rather that. I want somebody to believe the book, even if you can't read it. Them names are hard for you too, ain't they? Come on now, how many be honest with me tonight and say, Preacher, them names are hard. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you. Boy, that sure makes me feel good, brother. <laughs> and God smote him there from his e from his heir. And there he de died by the ark of God. All right, notice this fellow comes up, and this is King David bringing up the ark of God. And here's a fellow walking alongside of it there, and walking alongside, and the ark begins to shake just a little bit. And, I mean, he sees it shake a little bit, and he says, no, nothing big, I mean, what's the big deal? I could just step out, I could just put my hand out there and keep it from falling off, that's no big deal. What's wrong with a fellow trying to help out keep the ark from falling on the ground? What's the big deal about that? So he sticks out his hand to keep it from falling, and God strikes him dead. Didn't he? See? You say, well, preacher, it's just a little sin. It may be a whole lot bigger than you think it is. Look at here. If David had known the sin that would have occurred to him with Bathsheba, the sin that he was committing, do you think David would have committed his sin? Look at here. David said, well, it, it's no big deal. He didn't know the repercussions of the thing that happened. David committed a sin with Bathsheba. But you know something? This is 1985, and they're still making fun of David's sin. They got a movie. Somebody showed me in the newspaper. They have a movie out now about David. And a big deal, David. Don't you know it's going to mock David's sin? Don't you know that? Sure it is. Going to make fun of it and make. They're going to. I'll bet you in there somewhere they're going to say, "A man after God's own heart," and that was. And they're going to quote that thing. Say, "Here's a man after God's own heart," and they're going to make fun of David's sin. Bible says a great occasion for blasphemy against God. Boy, I bet you David have known what was happening. He'd sure never did what he did. See, you say it's only a little one. In God's sight, it may be a lot bigger than you think it is. Christians don't know the, 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 where sin brings them to. Look at, uh, look at uh, Abraham. Abraham was with Sarah, and Sarah couldn't have any children. And Sarah says, why, dear, take my handmaid. So Abraham gets him another wife. Boy, don't you know that Abraham had some children from his wife and went on and carried down Ishmael. Do you know where Ishmael's at today? He's over there in the land of Palestine uh, trying to fight against Israel and have been doing it for thousands of years. If Abraham had known how big his sin was, he should have, he'd have waited on God and got the child. So would have Sarah. So would have Sarah. Amen, brother? See, you, the sin is bigger than you think it is. We say it's only a little one. Brother, next time the devil tells you it's only a little sin, you better stop and think 
that uh, dead flies in the apothecary send forth a stinking savor, so doeth a little valley him that is in reputation of wisdom and honor. Dead fly number two. This fly. Boom, 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 plot into the pocket tray, John. Dead fly number two. It all depends on how you look at it. You ever hear him say that one? It all depends on how you look at it. You know what the problem is? You're not looking at it like God looks at it. That's the problem. You say it all depends on how you look at it. Well, I, I guess you're right. I guess you're right. You can look at it a thousand different ways. You get a felon, he looks at it this way, and you get a felon, he looks at it that way, and I may look at it a different way, and so and so may look at it a different way. But have you ever stopped to think about it, how the Lord looks at it? Say, well, it all depends on how you look at it. You know what you're trying to do? You're trying to justify your sin. That's what people do. They're looking around for a way, an excuse, to do what they want to do. That's it, brother. Uh, it all depends on how you look at it. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 6. 1 Samuel chapter 6, and look at verse 19. 1 Samuel chapter 6, and look at verse 19. Turn to the verse. 1 Samuel six nineteen, and it says... And he smote the men of Bishema because they had looked unto the ark of the Lord. Now here's a man that come along and they just get curiosity gets the best of them. And they come along there and they say, uh, what's in that ark? I wonder what's in there. And they come down around in there and they look into the ark. They look down in it. And they look down in there and you know what God did? It said God smote them for it. You say, what's wrong with looking? God told you not to. See, that's the problem. If God told you to do something in the, this book, you better do it God's way and not your way, brother. Better do it God's way and not your way. Uh, you know what it is? You see, how's, how, it all depends on how you look at it. Look here. How's an unsaved man look at it? You know something? You can tell you're doing wrong. Just go up and ask an unsaved man. He knows what's wrong all the time. Every unsaved man in this town knows it's wrong to go out and get drunk. Amen? Every unsaved man is wrong. If you, you, you say, Preacher, I just don't know what's wrong. Go ask an unsaved man. He'll tell you real quick. He guys good. He knows what's wrong. He knows. He can pull out, pull out the hypocrites in the church and say, Well, they're a hypocrite and they're a hypocrite and they're a hypocrite and they're a hypocrite. They can put your sin on you just that fast. It, you say it all depends on how you look at it. You've got to look at it in the sight of God's thing. Bible says, uh, let uh, uh, no appearance of evil. Let not your good be evil spoken of, says in the New Testament. Look here. I was in a store the other day, not the other day, quite a while ago. And I was in the store, and I was walking around the store, and I got a bad habit of taking things and picking them up when I'm ready to buy them instead of putting them in a car, uh, car uh, you know, one of these things you push around. I don't know what they're called. Basket. <laughs> push baskets. Or a sack or something. I take it and I put them in my pockets. I put them in there. And I stick them in my pockets. And I put a glass in my pocket. And my wife says, uh, Nathan, they're going to think you're stealing that. And I says, oh, no, they're not going to think I'm stealing that. I put that. I put a big old glass in there like that and stuck it in my pocket. I went on around the store and kept looking around a while. And I went out. I went up to the counter up there and checked everything out. And I forgot this glass in my pocket. <laughs> And I check it all out and check it all out. And my wife, she goes on out and leaves. And I check it on out and I walk out the door. And I'm walking out the door and my hand slips and hits this here glass on this pocket right here. And something hits it right there. And she says, Nathan, you still got that glass in your pocket. And I go. <laughs> like I look around to see if anybody was seeing me. And I says, if I walk out this door and somebody happens to see me, they'll think I'm stealing this glass for sure. And if I told them I forgot, they'll never believe me. You say, hey, preacher, there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, somebody think I stole it. Amen? So I went and turned back like that and walked around the line and walked back in line and walked back in the store and looked around a while and walked back through and jerked this thing out of my pocket and walked through and say, I'm buying this glass. <laughs> I forgot to buy one. <laughs> I didn't tell her I had it in my pocket. I said, I forgot to buy this. 
I want to buy this glass, and uh, I, I just forgot to get it while I was in here. <laughs> you say, Preacher, you lied. No, I was just trying to keep somebody from thinking I stole that thing. You said, don't make a difference. Makes a difference to somebody. Makes a difference to somebody. Look at here. Here's a fellow walking across the, the uh, road, and he sees a big old watermelon patch out there. Sign says, do not steal the watermelons. This fellow says, I won't steal a watermelon. I don't believe in stealing. So he walks through the watermelon patch. And somebody walks down the road and looks over there and sees him. And he's walking down the patch and his shoelace comes untied. So he bends over and ties his shoelace. And while he's tying his shoelace, this other guy looks over there and says, Aha, he's stealing the watermelon. Is he stealing the watermelon? No, he's just tying his shoe. But that guy over there will swear up and down on a stack of Bibles that that guy's stealing that water. And you know Christians don't get that thing in their heart and mind and soul. Bible says, let not your good be evil spoken of. You say, i got a good clean conscience in it. I, uh, it all depends on how you look at it. You better consider how other people look at it because you have to give account of how other people look at it. you got to have a testimony before them. You say, well people, I don't care what people think. God cares what people think. God's going to hold you accountable for what other people think of you. You've got a testimony as a Christian, and if you don't hold up that testimony, it's a dead fly in the apothecary jar. Don't ever let your good be evil spoken of. Amen? Young testimony before God. It counts. People are watching you. People are looking at you. People are counting in you. You say, nobody's looking at me. There's not a person in this building tonight that doesn't have about 50 people watching them like a hawk. And if you went out here and fell and the devil got you, you'd destroy about 25 and 30 people and you'd destroy their faith in God because they'll put your faith in you. Amen! They're saying, they're, you say, well, they're not watching me that close. They are too. They are too. I got a young man in my church. He, he got saved. He was a Roman Catholic. And he was studying to be a Roman Catholic priest. And he, he was in, in the monks for a, for a couple of years. And one night we went over and led him to the Lord. And that guy started coming to church. And he had a real bitter spirit. I mean, real bitter. He'd gotten saved, but he had a real bitter spirit. And he'd come in, he'd sit down in the pew, and I'd be preaching. And he'd, he'd get up something, and he'd look, and he'd give me a, almost a frown, almost a growl. And pretty soon I'd, I'd be start praying, oh, Lord, to get the devil out of him. <laughs> Lord, he's full of the devil. Get the devil out of him. And then a couple of months would go by, and he'd still have that bitter spirit. And a couple more weeks would go by, and, and still that bitter spirit. And I'd deal with him about it. And then I'd send some of the men by. And they'd go by, and they couldn't do nothing with him. Couldn't do a thing with him. And one day I said, uh, you either get rid of the bitter spirit, or you get out. And you say, what did you say that for, preacher? Nobody could deal with him. So he left the church for about a year. Left the church for about a year and went out there and, and felt sorry for himself and quit his job. And just quit working and quit doing nothing. Somebody said he was rolled up in a ball in a corner like this with a blanket on him all day long. And he just rolled up in a ball and got in a ball and rolled up in a ball like that with a blanket on him. You say, preacher... What does that guy mean to anybody else? Everybody in the church would say, so-and-so really reads his Bible, and he would. And so-and-so loves the Bible, and he did. And so-and-so knew more scripture than I do, and he did. Some of them. And they say, uh, if the Bible does that for him, uh, what does it do for me? And that guy knew the scripture. And I said, Lord, that thing there, although the kid doesn't know it, he's destroying other people. So I got to pray for him again. And I prayed for him and prayed for him and prayed for him. And somehow, I don't even know what happened to him. Pretty soon he started coming back to church. And I don't even know what it was. Couldn't even put my finger on it. And he was mad again. I'd look over the pulpit and I said, man, he's mad again. Yeah, he's mad again. Mm -hmm. and, and we'd be talking and he'd say, yeah, I ought to just go out and kill myself. I got thinking, well, that's okay, too. <laughs> but I didn't say that. I rebuked him for it. I said, you can't do that. And, 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 that shouldn't be done, you know. And you ought not to do that. 
And then he said, well, I'm just a Jonah. You know, that kind of bill. I'm just a Jonah. And he'd go out the door, I'd say, bye, Jonah. <laughs> you know, and laugh a little bit to him. <laughs> he'd go out the door and come back. And I just kept on praying for him. I said, God, give that guy the joy of the Lord. Give him something to laugh about. And then all of a sudden, and the Lord knows I don't know what did it, that fellow come in, and he was like a light bulb. He was like a neon light. That guy is like his personality, like a devil that got out of him or something, but he just turned 190 degrees. He started shaking the ladies' hands, talking to the ladies, started laughing, started... And it become alive! And he started asking honest questions in this book. You say, what is it? Say, it all depends on how you look at it. That's exactly what it is. It all depends on how you look at it. You better look at it in God's sight and not yours. In the block of tree, John did fly number three. My conscience doesn't convict me. As it says, uh, dead flies cause the ointment of the pocket there to send forth his stinking savor. So doeth the little folly him that is in repetition of wisdom and honor. My conscience doesn't convict me. You ever hear that one, brother? Ah. Uh, he come, they come along and say, well, it doesn't bother me. doesn't bother me. I, mean, I can do it. doesn't bother me not. You know what it is most of the time? I see Christians do this. Christians all have them a TV set, and sit in front of it and watch it and watch it and watch it and all the trash comes on and the naked women come on and the booze and everything else comes on and they say, well, it doesn't bother me. Of course it don't. You've been jaded. Of course it don't. You just sit under it and sit under it and sit under it until nothing bothers you. See, my conscience doesn't convict me. Christians will go out there and commit some of the terrible sins and say, well, it doesn't bother me. You know what happened? Sin won't bother you after a while. You take sin, just take a little bit of it. You take a drink. Now, for instance, you take a beer. You take one little beer. I remember when I took my first beer, I was about uh, 16 years old, me and Jim Brown. And I went out and I, I got a beer. We got 3-2 beer back in those days. Do they still have 3-2 beer? Well, I'm glad nobody knows. <laughs> but they had 3-2 beer back in those days. And, and we, I popped that 3-2 beer. And I, the first one I got was a hot one. You know, a hot one. And I started to drink that 3-2 beer down. And I started drinking it down. And, and the first time you ever taste beer, you know what it tastes like? It tastes like the most terrible, yucky stuff you ever tasted in your life. I mean, it tastes terrible, brother. A hot one. And I started drinking down that three, two beer. And I'd drink it down and I'd say to myself, Man, this is supposed to be good. This is supposed to be good. If, if I let them think that this is terrible, they won't think I'm a man. They won't think I'm tough. I've got to drink this thing down. And you're supposed to guzzle the first one, you know. <laughs> And so I started drinking this stuff down, and I'd, I'd drink it down, it was going down my throat, and it was hot and burning, and I was thinking, man, this stuff's yuck, but it's got to be good, it's supposed to be good. <laughs> drink it down, drink this stuff down, and I thought, man, whoo. and I smiled, you know, when it's too That was good, Jim. And on the inside I was saying, boy, that was rough. <laughs> boy, I got to do that again? <laughs> and you know something? That's exactly the way I felt about it. The first one I ever took in my life. I remember to this day. But you know something? I took another one. And then 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 I took another one. Until I'd, I would... And then I felt guilty about the first one I ever took. I felt like I'd really stolen something, you know. Boy, I really did something bad. <laughs> really did something bad. I felt that the conscience kind of bothered me. You know, I thought, boy, man, I'm drinking beer. I don't know, mess. man. Boy, I really did something bad. Drinking beer. Do you know something? After a while, I could drink a whole spix pack and didn't bother me a bit. I could go out and get drunk Friday night and Saturday night and didn't bother me a bit. That's the way sin works. Sin works out of weight on you. You say, preacher, your conscience won't convict you. It will at first. It will at first. But if you deaden that conscience and deaden it and deaden it and defile it, it won't bother you a bit after a while. And so you know what a man can do? He can sit inside a prison and say, I've stolen, I've killed, I've committed every crime there is to commit. And I said, does it bother you? And he'll say, no, it doesn't bother me. You know why? It did when they was about nine years old. Did when he was about ten. Did when he was about fourteen. You know, 
The older you get, the less that conscience is going to bother you. Fellas, so let your conscience be your guide. You better not. You better not let your conscience be your guide, because after a while, the conscience is no good. Take your Bible and turn to uh, the book of uh, uh, Timothy. Turn to Timothy. It says in Timothy, sear their conscience with a hot iron. Sear it with a hot iron. In 1 Timothy, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, as sear their conscience. I have this wrote down. I'm in 2nd... Oh, that's why I can't find it. I'm in 2nd Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4 is where it is. Uh... 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their... I'm in 1 Timothy 4, 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know what that is? fellow says, my conscience doesn't bother me. That's just one of them dead flies. You've got to take that conscience and you've got to work up a good conscience and you've got to get a good conscience and say, God, give me a conscience that's bothering you. You know what you want to get? You want to get one where you feel bad. Your conscience gives you a bad feeling. You say, I don't like bad feelings. That's a good conscience bothering you from sin. When a Christian's conscience no longer bothers him, and a Christian's conscience doesn't mess him up in sin, he's in bad shape. You ought to come tonight saying, Lord, give me a conscience that bothers me. You're a sinner, aren't you? Let me ask you, how many folks in this building are sinners tonight? A couple of you ought to raise both hands. <laughs> Amen? You've got some sins, don't you? Don't you have some sins, brother? Are you above sin? Is anybody attained and pure and without sin tonight? Well, you know something? You ought to get you a conscience that bothers you about this and bothers you about that and bothers you about that. Let me give you an illustration. There's the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm over here. And the further I get from him, the less I'm going to get to his holiness and his sin. I mean, my sin, his holiness. And the closer I get to him, the closer I get to him, the holier he gets, and the bigger sin I get. And the more I'm going to see my sin. So the closer you get to Jesus Christ, the closer you're going to see that you're a sinner and you come short of God's glory. You see that? You see that? A fellow thinks, thinks wrong, feels wrong, and is wrong. I bet you today that you have thought something that you shouldn't have thought. Come on, folks. Yeah. Haven't you thought something you shouldn't have thought today? Isn't there something that went through your head that was in your heart that dwells in you that shouldn't be there? Of course there is. You say, what do I do about it? Keep that conscience that bothers you all the time. When a Christian gets to the place where this don't bother him and that don't bother him and that don't bother him and that doesn't bother him, he's in trouble. He's in trouble. Take your Bible a minute and turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24. I want to show you a man that had such good conscience and such nice conscience that it bothered him when he cut a man's dress off of him. Yeah, you heard me. <laughs> uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24 and in 1 Samuel chapter 24, look at verse 4. And a man of David said unto him, Behold the day which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver the enemies into thy hand, that thou mayest do them uh, do to him as it should seem good. Chapter 23, and look at verse 2. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Look at that thing. Y'all lay in your heart. Lay in your heart. Put it out here. Don't let it get just in your head. Get it down in your heart and take it with you somewhere. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. That's what messes people up. Somebody following somebody else. If you could just follow your right folks and be willing to stand alone and go it alone. You know what a lot of preachers do? A lot of preachers just go it alone all by themselves. You better learn to walk alone, want to follow a multitude. Don't want to, you say everybody else has done it. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I want to know what God wants me to do. That's what's going to count in eternity. Not what everybody else is doing, but what does God say? Don't you know that the, the majority of people are wrong? You follow the crowd, the crowd's going to be wrong almost every time. 
You got to follow the Lord. Dead fly number five. Preacher, we know when to quit. Preacher, we know when to quit. You know when to quit, but you might not be able to quit. I'll say it again. You might not be able to quit. Fella, get on drugs. Starts with old age run drugs. They come by and say, well, you ought to try it. Man, you're not a man until you've tried that. But come on, boy, it's better than you think it is. Just one time, just try it. You can always quit. We know when to quit. Come on, you know something? Sin, you know what sin does? Sin gets into you, gets on you, gets locked on you. You take the sin of uh, drugs. Fellow take drugs and take drugs and take drugs. And get on him and get in him and get on him. You know something? There may become a time that you get on that drugs and you get on that stuff and you say, I can always quit. I know when to quit. And then you decide to quit. And boy, you'll rise up and you'll flesh and scream out to quit and you won't be able to quit. Get on that booze. I know a friend of mine. His name is uh, Johnny. Johnny. I, I love Johnny. Johnny's a real friend of mine. He got saved. But he was a drunk. He got saved in the house in my living room. And I said, Johnny, you're going to quit now. He said, Preacher, I'm going to quit. Boy, I'm going to quit drinking. Now, you got to get in the Bible, Johnny. you got to start reading the Word if you're going to quit and get victory over this. I sure will. And he went good for about four months. Man, he was dry as a bone for about four months. And then he went out and got drunk. And then he went out and got drunk again. Went out and got drunk again. And I've known Johnny years now. And I've lost track of how many times I go over Johnny's trailer and go over there and just sit there and cry and Johnny's nose would get real red face all puffed up with the booze and he lost his wife. His wife is gone and his kids are gone. And his brother can't doesn't want to have anything to do with him. And Johnny's there by himself and you know what he is? He's a preacher. Can I ever quit drinking? Preacher, can I ever quit drinking? You know what? Johnny wants to quit right now and he'd cut off his arm right here if he could quit drinking. He'd take a hacksaw and cut it right off if he could get rid of that booze. You know something? He can't do it. He can't do it to say he wants to. He'd die if he could get rid of it. He can't. He'll have to die to get rid of it. You say, preacher, I know when to quit. The thing is, don't ever start. Don't ever start. I got a man in my church. He smokes. He smokes. He's been smoking for 35 years. Now I'll get up and I have a message on uh, smoking. I mean, I preach the whole message on why it's a sin to smoke. That's the name of the message. I'll get up now, nail him, and get him good. He knows I'm preaching right at him. He loves the Lord. He loves the Bible. <laughs> he got a good heart. <laughs> he really does. And he'll get back there and he'll he'll just cry. He'll just get back there and he'll just cry. Now I'll see tears running down his face. He'll say to his wife, Boy, I wish I could quit. The preacher's right. Boy, I wish I could quit. I'll go out to his house and you can't smell smoke nowhere. You can't smell smoke in his car. You can't smell smoke in his house. You can't smell smoke in his garage. You can't smell smoke on him. He can't smell smoke nowhere. But he still smoked. You say, what's that guy want to do? He would love to get rid of that thing. But you know something? He got hooked on it when he was a kid. He got hooked on it before he got saved. And he never got the victory. I think he's still fighting it. But he can't quit. He wants to, but he can't. He was that preacher. Some of you young people here tonight, you say, Preacher, we know when to quit. Go you ask some of these other saints in the Lord that love the book and love this church and love to serve God and they still got that sin on them and they can't get rid of it. And go ask them about it. Their heart will boil up inside of them. They'll say, Preacher, I wish I could get rid of it. And if you look at them, they'd say, Don't you ever start. Amen! I did tell you. I'll tell you here this evening. Don't you ever start it. Because then you won't have to fight it to try to get rid of it. That's a, that'll do with all kinds of sins, preacher. Plunk in the pocket of every jar. Send forth the stinking savior. 
Says dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doeth the little folly him that is a reputation of wisdom and honor. Dead fly number six. Preacher, we always have done it and nothing has hurt us yet. Preacher, we always have done it. We've always done it. I get up and preach this message. I preach against uh, self-righteousness and self satisfaction and people saying, well, preacher, I've always done it. Walk out the front door and turn to me and say, preacher, I've always done it. You've done it your whole life, some of you. Some of you getting a thing and you've done it since you was a kid. And you've done it all your life. You know what that thing is? That kind of thing is stubbornness. That's a stubbornness in your heart and mind and soul. Looky here. You're going home to heaven. You're going to die and you're going to go home to heaven. And when you get home to heaven, you're going to be sinless. And you're not going to have any sin on you. And you're going to have a perfect body that will not sin and will not be tempted to sin. And will never sin again. And you know what some of you are going to do? You're going to go home to the judgment seat of Christ. And you're going to come in to the throne of God in a perfect body and sinless. And then the Lord's going to go through the judgments and lay out the rewards. And then you're going to come up before the Lord and the Lord's going to show you all the victory you could have had it done and all the things that you could have gave up for the Lord and all the things that you could have done for God. And then you're going to Lord Jesus Christ and you're going to come up on your hands and knees and you're going to say... Well, Lord, I didn't know that I had your power back then. Well, Lord, I didn't know that I could get victory over that sin. Lord, uh, let me just go back and do it all over again, Lord. Let me go back and start over again. And I'll come through different this time, Lord. You know what the Lord's going to say to you? No. You only had one chance to come through. You should have done the thing. You can't do it now. Next. And then start judging the next fellow. You know how many time, how many lives you got to live for Jesus Christ? One life. That's all you got. What are you going to give up for Jesus Christ? What have you given up for Jesus Christ? What have you stopped for the Lord Jesus Christ? Just for Him. What is it? You say, preacher, sure I've started, but I failed. It's hard to start something. You and I got in life. I give up this sin, and that's the name that one. And I got that sin there, and I give that up for Him. I give that sin right there. I give that up for him. Here's another one. Have you ever got a conviction about spending money foolishly? How many of you ever heard of Pac-Man? You all heard of Pac-Man. Sure you have. (coughs) Everybody's heard of Pac-Man. Go down and take Pac-Man, quarter in Pac-Man, zip him around, lose. Another quarter, 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 zip him around, lose. And pretty soon you've spent ten dollars. Isn't that a waste of money? Sure, you say, well, preacher, I put $10 and $20 and $30 and $40. Man, what a waste of money. You know something? You're sinning. How's that one for you? You know what I did? I said, Lord, I'm never going to play it again. I'm not going to play it no more. Give it up. I'm going to give that up for you. I'm not going to quit no more. I'll play that stupid game again. Now, put a court on. Now, if you want to play that game, it's free country. I mean, I'm not saying it's a sin for you to play it. Go ahead and play it. <laughs> I'm not putting some on you. I'm just putting this on myself, okay? Now, if you want, if you say, well, that preacher thinks it's a sin to play Pac Man, I didn't say that. <laughs> I just said it was for me, you see? It's for me, because I said, Lord, I'm going to quit something for you. I'm going to quit something for you. I went in there the other day. I said, I'm not going to play it. I reached in my pocket and curled out my bill for it. Good, there's no quarters. <laughs> Isn't that the way you are? Isn't that the way you are? Aren't you the same way with your sin? You go home, you say, boy, I'm glad I don't have any on me tonight. <laughs> or you go into the buy spot and say, oh, boy, I'm glad there's not any of that. Drink one out. You say, Christian, drink beer. I've known some Christians who drink beer. They're saved. They're born again. And drink some. What's your sin? What's your sin? You got one? You're going to give it up for Jesus Christ? Now, maybe I haven't named your sin. Maybe I'm not getting 
personal love for sin. Maybe I ought to say jealousy. Maybe I ought to say jealousy. That's a good one. That ought to get some of you. How about pride? How about the sin of pride? That ought to get some of you, the sin of pride. Some of you is proud of the peacock. All right. What about the sin of griping? That's a sin. Griping. What about belly eating griping? What about that sin? Complaining. That's a sin. He said, well, preacher, I'll never... How about this one? Worry. We, these girls sing about worrying tonight. And they won't worry and they'll, they won't get worry and get rid of worry until the Lord comes back. I believe it's a sin to worry. He said, preacher, you commit that one? I've committed it too, brethren. But if you're trusting God like you ought to trust Him, why should you worry? You shall preach, can't help it. Sin. Sin. You ought to trust God for it. God will take care of you. You get to worrying about those things. Sin! You know what people think? They think like this. Preacher, how much can I get away with? How much can I keep on doing? And what before God just kills me? See, that's the way they think. You know, you got your thinking all wrong. You know what you ought to be thinking? Lord, what can I give up for you tonight? You ought to think about something to give up for. All eyes, heads bowed, and Christians praying this evening. What does the book say? What does the book say? Not what is your opinion. Not what everybody else feels about it. Not when you think you can quit. Not just a little bit. Not because everybody else is doing it, not because your conscience bothers you. What does the Lord feel about it? How does he feel about your sin? How about this evening? Can you take a sin in your heart and life this evening and say, Lord, I want to give it up just for you? You know something? You'd give it up for the doctor, wouldn't you? If you went to the doctor tonight and the doctor says, you do it one more time and you'll die, you'd quit. You'd quit. If you went to the doctor and the doctor said, you've got this disease, and this disease here is up to a certain limit, and if you don't get rid of this particular thing and this particular thing, you're going to be in sad trouble. You'd quit tonight, you would. You sure would. You'd quit for the doctor, you would. How about doing something for the Lord Jesus Christ? Just for him, because now's the time to do it. You get to the judgment seat of Christ, you can't give up anything for him then. The life is over. Your life is done. How about taking that sin of yours tonight and say, Lord, I want to give it up. I want to quit it. And by your grace and by your mercy, I'll never do it again. How about it? How about it, Christian? All eyes closed and all heads bowed and Christians praying this evening. Now, as a Christian here this evening, say, Preacher, it's just a dead fly. It's just a little one. It's just a little one. But I want to give it up for the Lord tonight. How about it? Will you raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. There's a little one, but I want to give it up. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another? Thank you. Amen. Is there another? Is there another? Thank you. Thank you. Is there another? Is there another? Thank you. Thank you. Is there another this evening? Thank you. Is there another this evening? Amen. Is there another this evening? Is preacher just a little one? Thank you. Thank you. Is there another? Say, preacher, just a little one, but I want to give it up for Jesus Christ. Pray for me that I can. Will you raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you. Is there another? Is there another? Thank you. Is there another? Say, preacher, it's just a little one, but I want to give it up for Jesus Christ. Pray for me that I can and that I will. By the grace of God, I will. Is there another? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this evening, as your people make this decision in their heart and in their lives, that by your grace and by your mercy, you'll help them not say, it's just a little one so I can do it and justify it, and say, only it's just once so I can do it and justify it. But Lord, help them to say never again, and Lord, help them to get rid of the little ones in their lives. In Jesus' precious name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Take your hymnal and turn the page. 394 in your hymnal, page 394.
Lord, if you'll help me, if it's possible, Lord, I won't do it again. Do not take the attitude that, Lord, I'm sorry I did it, but I'll do it again. Right in here. Right in here. That's not it, brother. God wants you to stop. God wants you to quit. God wants you to change. God wants you to be different. You gotta take that sin and you gotta deal with it. You gotta deal with it. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Only God knows. But you gotta take it and say, "Please, just a little one. It'll never stay level. It'll never stay level. It'll grow and it'll grow and it'll grow until it destroys you. You gotta take it and you gotta deal with it. And you better deal with it tonight. This is the way to deal with it. And Christians pray for it. The Holy Spirit trying to deal with it. Now's the time to take it. Now's the time to deal with it. You want a revival? You want a revival in your heart? You want a revival in this church? Christians have first got to deal with sin. Maybe it's jealousy. Maybe it's the right Maybe it's complaining. Maybe you got a great right complaining attitude. A great right complaining spirit. That's a sin, but you need to uh, get rid of that man. And you need to come to God and say, God, forgive me. I've been frightened. I've been complaining. And God give you what you've got in your life. You need to confess that as a sin. And put it under the blood of Jesus Christ tonight. And say, God, by your grace, I'll stop it. I'll stop it and start rejoicing in Jesus Christ. You're saved, you're born again, and you're going to heaven. you got nothing to complain about. But you come. Let's sing the next step. All to Jesus I surrender. Okay, I'd just like to ask you to do your very best to bring somebody with you tomorrow night. Come back. I'm sure you've been dealt with. Everybody's been dealt with tonight. That's good. You need it. And I thank the Lord from the depths of my heart, from the very depths of my heart, for this message tonight. Try hard to get somebody to come back. Something can happen. You bring them around. The Lord's able, the Spirit of God, give them all that they need. Okay, keep your heads bowed now. We'll close out with a word of prayer. Brother Billy, can you ask God to get us safely to our homes?
Amen. Okay, be careful on the outside. Watch the kids.